Good morning. I'm Bonnie Gardner. I'm co-chair of the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. We're located at 4700 Grover Avenue. Our forums are free and open to the public and occur most Sundays at noon. We encourage you to attend. For more information on our forums, you can go to our church website at www. AustinUU.org. And now uh, one of our forum committee members will introduce our speaker, Dale Bula. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Peter Pfeiffer is an architect, property manager, and building scientist who was one of the first in America to be named a fellow of the American Institute of Architects for his <laughs> lifetime achievement in developing practical high performance and green building strategies. He's a principal of the Austin, Texas based Barley Pfeiffer Architects. <coughs> because of their leadership in advanced green building, their work has been published in such diverse venues as the Washington Post, the Better Homes and Garden, been featured on NPR radio, the Discovery Channel, even This Old House and HG Television Network. In 2006, a residential architect cited him as one of the 10 most influential architects in the past decade, and in 2010, he was nominated for the prestigious Hanley Award for his meaningful efforts to advance green building in America. We are very pleased to have him with us this morning. I present uh, Barley Pfeiffer talking with us about the magic of green building. Go, Peter, go. All right. <clears throat> Is this on, by the way? No? No, it is. Oh. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Dale. That was a nice introduction. I appreciate that. You know, uh, I think it's appropriate, I hope it's appropriate to say that this green building stuff really isn't that difficult. It really isn't. It's not that hard. Uh, it does remind me of the three nuns approaching the gates of St. Peter when St. Peter said, girls, you, you just can't waltz right in. You have to answer a quiz, each and every one of you. But it's simple. It's easy. Don't worry about it. And the first nun is asked, who is the first man on earth? And she said, well, that's easy. That was Adam. And boom, the gates open up, and in she walks. The bells and whistles go off. And she asked, who is the second? Then the second nun was asked, um, who is the first woman on earth? Well, that's easy. That was Eve. And Whistles, whistles, bells go off, and boom, in she goes. Third nun was asked, what was the first thing that Eve said to Adam? And she looks at her friends on the other side of the gate, and she scratches her head. Hard one. Boom, the whistles go off, the bells go off, and in she goes. <laughs> so uh, I hope it was okay. But the point is, <laughs> this, this movement that we once knew of green building is changed, and it needed to. I call it high-performance building and remodeling now, and I speak of seeing beyond the glare of eco-bling. Because so many times in this country, like so many things in our society, we took a movement and we crunched it and we crunched it and we smushed it and we bought it and we sold it, and it's no longer what it used to be. We all get wrapped up in things like, hey, I'll, t I'll tease you. How many of you think tankless water heaters are a good way to go to save energy? Come on, show me. All right, well, there's a good example. If you crunch the numbers, it's about a 25 to 71 year payback. Is that a smart thing? The industry jumped in and everybody became stakeholders and we all had things like, gee, we needed, if a little bit of insulation in our walls was good, then a whole lot was even better. Or was it better for Owens Corning and the other manufacturers of insulation? So I'm going to talk to you about some practical approaches to green building today. My background is important for you to know because I'm not just a talking head up here. We are practicing architects, but there is a nice background to us. We, I grew up in construction. My parents had seven kids. Yes, we were Catholic. And we, they, had, they had dreams of putting all of us through very good schools. Uh, all of my siblings and myself went to the top northeastern schools like Harvard and Yale and Dartmouth. I went to Rensselaer, the oldest engineering and science school in the, in the English-speaking world. They put a high premium in education, but how are they going to pay for it? They bought rental properties and had me and my five brothers remodel and maintain them. 
And we, they actually hired a master carpenter to teach us how to do a lot of this stuff. So from the time I was a little tyke, I was doing construction work, and I think I ended up with more construction background than most of my builder friends in the industry today. So I like getting my dirt under my fingernails. I like testing things. So everything I'm going to talk about today, I have built myself and tried out. I also own rental properties here in downtown Austin on West 6th Street, and those old houses have become my green building laboratory over the past 25 years. So that's the other thing about property management. It's one thing to research a green strategy. It's another thing to have to pay for it with your own dollars. Then you really appreciate whether or not you want to spend your money on that. But it's a third thing to see 5, 10, 15, 25 years later, did it turn out to be a good investment? And that's where I think we differ from most of the other folks who might be talking to you about high-performance building. We've actually walked the walk, paid for the walk, and maintained the walk. And that's where you get different answers. So we get very involved in new construction, remodeling, interior design, and building science consulting. Because I ended up here in Austin by, in a flu basically by way of a fluke. I was on my way to uh, Berkeley in Northern California stopped to visit a cousin in Houston who said, you know, why don't you take a break and go work for a little while between undergraduate and graduate school. My first degree was in building sciences from Rensselaer, and I did get a job with an architectural firm, and that lasted a good amount of time until the Shah, whose palace we were designing in Iran, got deposed. Then we were laid off. <clears throat> and that's when I learned that international politics do affect your life. I ended up going to uh, work for a builder who was building a high-rise that we'd been on the design team of in Houston that got awarded subsequently as the most energy-efficient high-rise in the world. It was the IBM building down on Woodway in South Post Oak. Great experience, fantastic experience to build the building you did the plans for. But then I got bored and looked for graduate schools. And at that point, there was the University of Texas with a physicist on staff named Paco Arumi who was taking a physicist approach to architecture. And I came to graduate school here to get my master's in energy studies under him, where he actually showed, he would develop the first energy analysis program in the world. It's pretty neat because it was a dynamic energy response of buildings. It was called dynamic, meaning buildings consume energy based on the way they're built, the climate they're in, but a third element, how they're used. And that's why I say what I did about the tankless water heater. You might think water heating is a significant part of your energy bill every month, but what if it's just Dale and his wife living there as empty nesters? And they take not 25 or 30 minute showers every day the way my teenagers do. They're not doing 12 loads of wash a week. No, you're doing maybe one load of wash a week. You're maybe taking a 10 minute shower, maybe even every other day. The point is your use is so much less that the amount of hot water you actually need is so much less. So that's what this energy run is able to do. It helps, helps us make smart decisions for the way a home is used or the way a building is used, not just based on the other things that you might see the Department of Energy Studies are talking about. And when you do look at a building with a little bit more depth that way, you come up with very different answers. And that's why we ended up doing building science consulting all across the country for the past 25 years. Uh, a quick example is we were doing a consultation in Hong Kong where I noticed that the, uh, a big problem with this house that was designed by these Chinese gentlemen was that it had a lot of excessive solar gain associated with the views out the windows that faced towards uh, the harbor and there was windows faced southwest. And I talked about some type of awning or overhang to shade them. Well, they couldn't do that because it was a zero lot line building and they can't stick their awnings over to their neighbor's property. So then we talked about the expensive but very effective shutters or uh, roll screens on the outside that automatically roll down in the afternoon. You can still see through them, but they cut out the solar radiation. Well, they're pretty expensive. They're about $20,000 US. We weren't sure about whether or not that was in the budget. So we continue walking around their job site, and they're talking about how they're going to excavate out where the driveway goes to put in a 40,000-gallon rainwater collection cistern. And I looked around, and I said, well, what are you using the rainwater for? You've got a teeny yard. It's about the size of that aisle. Well, yeah, and, and are you going to use it for inside the building? Well, no, we've already got a city water tap, and, and water is pretty inexpensive out here. Yeah, and I noticed that you also get 90 inches of rain spread out 
pretty evenly throughout the whole year. So what do you need to store water for? And you know what their answer was? Uh, This U.S. Green Building Council's lead program gives us points for doing it. That's why we're doing it. I said, it makes no sense whatsoever. Take that $40,000 and use half of it to put in the solar screens that we talked about and forget about the rainwater system. And that is a good example of what's happened to the Green Building Program or the Green Building Movement. It became an industry based on a checklist based on supporting itself instead of making for intelligent, high-performance buildings. And it's interesting because the oldest green building program in the English-speaking world came from Austin, Texas. Did you know that? Here's a neat story. Back in the early 80s, uh, we were very interested, we, the citizens of Austin, told the city council that we were very interested in divesting from the South Texas nuclear power plant. We didn't like electricity produced by uh, nuclear power. And one can have their arguments about that, by the way. A quick aside, did you know who's most responsible for global warming, probably of any organization in the world? Greenpeace. If you want to be cynical, but you can be, think about this. Greenpeace did such an effective job in stopping the proliferation of nuclear power plants. What did we build instead? Coal. It's not, there are studies that actually show that probably some of the most amount of coal plants were built because of the motivation of Greenpeace. So you've got to watch out for that world of unintended consequences. But I digress. Let's go back to the story here because it's an interesting story. So we wanted to get away from this uh, nuclear-powered energy, and the city council put together a commission called the Resource Management Commission that my boss, my employer at the time, an architect in town named Mac Holder, wonderful man, was invited to be on this commission to help the city figure out how to save energy. We're a very unique city in many ways, but one of the ways we're unique is when it comes to power generation. Many of you may not know this, but there's the eastern U.S. grid, the western U.S. grid, and then the Texas grid. Did you know that? Doesn't surprise you, probably does it. But then within Texas, there is one city that owns all of its own power plants. That's us. So we had the ability to do some things without government intervention, and we tested out a lot of energy efficiency strategies, came up with the concept of the conservation power plant. We named it the Austin Energy Star Program because the star in the state of Texas was Austin, and it did such a good job that it became a national program. Now they just dropped the name Austin off of it. But the Energy Star program, as you know it, started here in Austin because we were incenting people to buy more efficient washing machines and dishwashers and and air conditioning systems and and light bulbs. And we found that it was one-third as expensive to incent people to save energy than it was to build a new power plant. And that was a neat thing, this Austin Energy Star program starting here in 1984, and 25 years later it took for them to finally have to get invested in a new power plant. For 25 years, the city grew from 580,000 to over a million, and we didn't have to invest in a new power plant because of our effectiveness of saving energy. And that makes a point about what I'm going to talk about today. It's always more effective to save energy or save a resource than to find a way of creating more of that resource. It's cheaper to save energy by doing things to your building than putting solar panels on the roof to generate energy. It's cheaper to conserve water than investing in a rainwater collection system. All that, it's cheaper to not pollute the air inside your house and more effective than it is to buy one of those fancy ventilation systems. Across the board, conservation is still number one. Well, this Energy Star program did so well, we applied it to water conservation, and we also applied it to the problem we had with our landfill spaces uh, being used up. And where does 40 to 50% of your landfill garbage come from? the building industry. So we started incenting builders and architects to design buildings to use, to be less wasteful, to recycle more things like cardboard and steel and even wood and jitboard so we could reduce the amount of volume that went to our landfills. And after a while we realized this was no longer an energy conservation program. It was water, building materials, and energy. What do we name it? It was Mary McLeod 
1991 in a room in downtown Austin. I was there. He said, why don't we do the Austin Eco Program? We didn't like that name. Austin Green Program, eh, it's getting close. Austin Green Building Program, bingo, that's it. And that's how the first green building program in North America got started, right here in Austin. And it wasn't for altruism. It was for very practical reasons. So when, if you're building green, you have no further to look than the very vetted Austin Green Building Program. It's still considered one of the most practical and effective in the United States. It's sort of a nice thing, too. It's in our home, right in our hometown. So in my view, green building boils down to these three very basic things you just heard me allude to. It's reduced consumption of stuff. Energy is a big one. Building materials is another one. And water is another one. That's really big. Reduce consumption. Live well, consuming less. It's also about improved health, indoor air quality, and I hope to touch on that today. And then the third point is reduce, reduced environmental impact. It's better remodeling a church in central Austin than it is building a new church out in the hill country that makes everyone drive 25 miles a day, I mean, every time they go to church, because then you have a larger societal carbon footprint. It's better to remodel your house in Hyde Park than to build a new house in Dripping Springs, for example, on virgin land. That's what we mean about reduced environmental impact. So let's jump into this. My views on how to accomplish this is to keep it simple, rely on smart, thoughtful, climate-sensitive design solutions as opposed to gizmos, because gizmos and complex things break, and they cost money to fix. I had quite a few tankless water heaters that I was operating. Do you know that you have to acid flush them every year to maintain that high efficiency, or certainly every other year? So you might think by year three or year five, you've got this neat, expensive machine on your wall that's producing cheap hot water, but at that point, it's probably producing hot water no less expensively than a machine that costs one-third the amount of money. So a lot of people don't do that, and I saw some eyes light up. Gizmos and complex things need maintenance and they break, and that's why we don't rely on them that much anymore. But when it comes to energy conservation, the top thing here, reduced consumption of energy, oftentimes people ask me, what do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? And I thought of this food guide pyramid from the uh, Department of Agriculture that many of us grew up around when we were kids, where at the bottom of the pyramid it talks about making your staple be your fruits, vegetables, your grains. That's what you want the staple of your diet to be. And as you go up near the top, then you can have your sweets, your cheese, your spices, those things like that, but use those sparingly. Ah, good analogy. At the very bottom of the energy conservation or the energy use pyramid is to not build the house any bigger than it has to be or the facility. Don't oversize because if you oversize it, you're just consuming more resources. Build it tightly. You can't air condition or heat the whole neighborhood. Can think about solar orientation. Your same house facing south or north will use probably 25% less energy than if it faces west. So be cognizant of solar orientation. And then the last one is take advantage of natural vegetation to shade you in the summertime and protect you from the winter winds in the winter. The nice thing about those strategies across the bottom is that once you implement them into your house or your facility, you don't have to maintain them. They're there for the life of the facility, so they're, relative, they're very cheap in terms of no maintenance. Once you accomplish that, then you can look at using your power more efficiently. Get that more efficient air conditioning system or that better uh, washing machine that uses less water and energy or the LED or fluorescent bulbs. Use your power efficiently. But the point is, it's not as effective a strategy, the middle tier, as the lower tier, because those things in the middle tier break. They need to be maintained. They need to be fixed. The things in the lowest rung of this, of this pyramid don't need to be maintained or fixed. Once you've done these first two things, then you can start looking at whether or not things like producing your own power via wind turbines or solar panels make sense. But the point is, don't go to the top of the pyramid first. Get the basic stuff taken care of first because the things at the top of the pyramid are the most expensive and the least effective. These are more effective and less expensive, and this is the least expensive way to go and the most effective way to go. So I hope that helps some of you. 
Let me give you a very cogent example. We have a lot of folks who have me come out to look at their homes for them. They're thinking of taking advantage of these solar rebates. Well, great, but you know, if we just shade the windows of your house, we might be able to save more energy than $15,000 worth of solar panels on the roof. And I know this for a fact. I have these old buildings on 6th Street. Just by putting these awnings above the windows of this old duplex at the end of 6th Street, we reduce the air conditioning loads by a third. And the windows last longer and the windows stay cleaner. And we don't have a solar system to maintain up on the roof. Because this is my own house that I built years ago. At the time I built it, 12 years ago, it was the highest rated green home in the history of Austin's green building program and one of the highest rated in the United States. But what I really liked about this house in Tarrytown is if you looked at it, you wouldn't realize it's so green. I didn't want it to shout green. I wanted it just to be a good looking home. But there are two things in this slide I want you to notice. The swimming pool, because I never owned a house with a swimming pool before, and that solar system up on the roof. We designed the house to face the right direction with the right angle to the roof with the few penetrations coming through the roof so that it could easily accept the solar system when the city came through with its rebates in 2004. I built the house in 2001, 2002. So I own a house with a solar system and I understand why they're called active solar systems. And it's not a joke, it's true. You have to actively participate in the maintenance of that system. And you might even notice uh, the panels in the begin in the middle there of the slide, right? Those panels there have a film on them. It shows you that you can't just hose them off to clean them. You have to scrub them. Just like if you washed your car and cleaned all the windows and parked it out in the street for a year. When you came back a year later, you would notice it would be dirty, probably scummy. Could you just rinse it with a hose and it would get clean? No, you'd have to scrub it, that windshield especially. Well, that's the same thing with solar panels. You have to just not rinse them, you have to scrub them. How many of you are going to do that? Really? All right, Dale would. <laughs> Dale and I are kindred souls because there I am up scrubbing my solar panels. So, Dale, you can come over sometime. Oh, he, okay. But the point is, look, it's a, it's a system that today would probably only cost about $12,000 to install. So let's be fair. But it really only saves me about $25 to $35 a month. That's a long payback. If it wasn't for the federal energy rebates and other things, it would not be a smart choice, albeit Electricity here is inexpensive, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. If this were Hawaii, where it's 45 cents a kilowatt hour, different story. But I'm not really trying to diss the idea of solar panels as much as to make the point that you want to prioritize where you put your money and your efforts. Because I did a pretty extensive energy modeling of my home, just as we do of our buildings, and this is what I, I found out. The shading of these windows from the south southern sun with those broad four-foot overhangs, just the shading of those windows saves more energy a year than those solar panels produce for me up on the roof. But unlike the solar panels on the roof, what the broad overhangs also give me is enhanced interior comfort better reflected daylight. We don't get solar glare. We don't have to close the blinds during the day. We get nicer daylighting. We have less painting to do on the outside of the house because it doesn't get as much ultraviolet bombardment and the windows stay cleaner. Solar panels don't give any of those benefits. So I'm saving the same amount of energy. Oh, and there's one last thing. The overhangs won't break. They won't need to be replaced. They don't need to be scrubbed every year. So that's the point about smart design. And then midway up the pyramid, I talked about using your power more efficiently. Well, you know, I never knew how expensive those things called swimming pools were to maintain till I owned one. It cost us more electricity every month to run that swimming pool than it did to air condition the house with three different air conditioners. So I did set about figuring out why, and it's the way the plumbing was done. These sharp turns in the plumbing, like you see right there, aren't very easy on that pump. That pump means it's got to push water and make it turn hard and turn hard again, and it makes for a lot of electricity being used unnecessarily. So we use sweep 90-degree bends and stuff like that now, and we got rid of this multi-port pump, a multi-port valve. Do any of you have a swimming pool? And do you ever have to maintain it? Does it have one of those sand filters where you have to backwash it? 
Well, what I found out is that uses up a lot of energy too because the water has to go through the circuitous path to get back to backwash the, the sand filter and just to run it, it, it has to go through a circuitous path. So I replaced the pump. I spent an extra $800 on this Pentair IntelliFlow pump. It made it quieter and it saved me twice as much energy a month as that $16,000 solar system does. So for $800, I was getting twice the benefit of a $16,000 solar investment. It's so important to save energy with swimming pools that if the state of Florida had enacted their pool energy efficiency uh, codes 20 years ago that they have in place now, they could have gotten away with building six fewer coal-fired power plants in the state of Florida over the past two decades. So swimming pools are probably the single highest consumer of energy in the southern United States, even more so than air conditioning, which we always thought of as being the number one consumer. Swimming pools are responsible for more energy consumption than anything else in homes in the southern United States. So you want to pay attention to them. And by the way, I replaced the sand filter with a cartridge filter and got rid of that complicated valve and saved about another 10 to 15% of electricity because it's easier to push the water through a cartridge filter than it is through a sand filter. So there was an example of the middle tier of using your power more effectively. But in the bottom, the very bottom, we talked about design leadership and the overhangs, but you know, it really goes earlier. It goes way back to the feasibility converse, uh, conversation you're having with your client. It doesn't matter if it's their house or their new office building or their art museum or their church. It's in the very, very, very beginning of the process that you can save the most amount of energy in natural resources. Let me give you an example with a home. A two-story home is going to be inherently more energy efficient than a one-story home. A two-story building is going to probably be more energy efficient than a one-story building because the two big problems we have here in terms of making us consume energy is the infiltration of outside air, the humidity, and solar radiation coming into the windows and bombarding the roof. So the smaller the roof, the less solar radiation you're having to fight. So a two-story house is going to be easier to keep cool and to heat than a one-story house. That's the type of stuff that you can't add to later with a green consultant. You have to have been talking about that in the very beginning of the process. Steeply pitched roofs of a dark color are going to be a lot more responsible for energy consumption than your solar panels you might add on the roof later. So let's not do a steeply pitched roof. We don't have many big blizzards here. And we do want the broad overhangs that are easier to do with a lightly pitched roof. So these are things we have to talk about early on in the process. And the third thing is to look at the cost of owning the building versus just the cost of building the building. It's an interesting study that the National Association of Realtors did in conjunction with the National Association of Home Builders that showed that if you take a, a family of, I think, four, to, um, and you have them in this house for 20 to 25 years, that the cost, there are other costs that dwarf the cost of building the house. Over a 20 to 25 year time period, maintenance and insurance will probably exceed the cost of building the home. Energy, and co energy consumption will too. Those are the bigger parts of the pie. The construction of the home will probably only be about 20 to 25 percent of the total cost of owning the home over a quarter of a century. So by doing smart design decisions and doing good construction, you can save a lot more money than just saving a few bucks on the construction of the house. An example in this picture is that metal roof added about seven, eight thousand dollars to the construction cost of this house at the time. But because it's a class four hail rated roof, and because it was installed in a special way that makes it a radiant barrier roof as well as a ventilated roof, that roof saves them more energy every year than the added cost of the roof to the mortgage. That roof also saves them more in their insurance premiums every year than the added cost to the mortgage. That seven or $8,000 may be added $35 a month to the mortgage payment, but that metal roof that will never have to be replaced for about 50 years, well, so not never, but 50 years, 
saves them more energy, twice as much energy every month than it costs them to add to their mortgage payment. That's why Habitat for Humanity, the second largest builder in the United States, tries to do metal roofs. They're the least expensive homes to own. So we encourage our clients to make smart decisions. It's cheaper building your house better than investing in a really good 401k. It really is. If you're looking at the cost of living, you've got to look at how much it costs to own your house. And you've got to look at your income. It's more effective to put your money into building your house better than it is to investing your money in a fairly conservative stock fund. That's just one example. A lot of us are baby boomers. We're looking at things that way probably at this point in our life. Another point we bring up to folks when they first think about building a facility or building a house is to um, orientate it correctly. A house on an east-west running street is probably going to cost less money to operate than a house on a north-south running street. Because most houses have the majority of their windows in the front and the back. So you want those windows to be facing north or south. Minimize your windows facing east or west. So think about it. A house on an east-west running street will have more of its windows facing north and south and therefore easier to control from an air conditioning and heat gain point of view. Who would have guessed? And then the two-story housing, the vertically zoned house, the master suite is upstairs in this house. This couple did realize, you know, there is a catch term that we want to build a home to age in place in. Really? Do you think you could be wanting to pay the Eaton School District taxes when you're 75 years old? No, they probably don't, the client couple said during programming. They originally came to us saying they wanted a master suite down, but they realized they were in their early 40s. They weren't going to be owning that house much past the time their kids go to high school or go to college. So we put all the bedrooms upstairs. So you're only operating half the house at a time when you go to bed or half the house, the downstairs, when you're awake during the day. Cuts the energy consumption by 25 or 30 percent, that one programming idea. And they do have a guest suite downstairs in case one of them has knee surgery or something like that and can't hobble up the stairs. But the point is, you want to talk about these things. You want to think beyond the obvious. It's not as tough as you think, but there are a lot of these little design decisions in the beginning that will have a profound effect on the consumption of energy. Same with this remodeling house we did, remodeling of a home we did in Tarrytown about 10 years ago. It won some nice statewide awards. Five or six architects were interviewed and about five or six builders. We got the job because when the homeowner asked us about which windows we would recommend replacing to save the most amount of energy, we helped pull them back from that minutia. Say, let's look at the bigger picture. If you're really concerned about saving energy, let's not add on to the back of the house. Let's not put that new master suite and family room in the backyard. Let's put a second floor on the house. Put all the bedrooms on the second floor and reconfigure the downstairs to get that family room and that larger kitchen. That will save you some money, by the way, but more importantly, it will probably save you about 30% on your energy consumption for the reasons I just described to you. So oftentimes, you want your architect or your consultant to help you see beyond what you're looking at and look at the big picture. I always urge our clients, tell me what your goals are. Don't tell me what you're thinking of doing. Tell me what your goals are, what you're thinking of accomplishing. And then we can come up with some solutions you may not have thought about. Same with ceiling heights. You would think, what, what does ceiling heights have to do with energy consumption? Well, air, conditioned, air conditioning does what? It conditions our air. So if you have 30% or 20% less air to condition, that's less work for your air conditioner. Less filtering of air, less dehumidifying of air, less cooling of air. So we go with nine-foot ceiling heights with some accents here and there to give it some interest. But don't go all over the house with 10-foot ceilings or 12-foot ceilings because that's 20, 30, 35% more air to condition. So it's simple little things like that. Now let's talk about indoor air quality. We just talked about energy consumption. But we've heard of energy recovery ventilation systems, have you? These ERVs, uh, there's this group out of Atlanta called ASHRAE that describes the need to uh, get a certain amount of fresh air in every house depending on the amount of people and the size of the house. Well, if you step back and you think about what you're trying to accomplish, it's better air quality. Not necessarily outside air, but better air quality. So what if we just 
didn't pollute the air as much in the first place, then we wouldn't need an expensive piece of equipment that costs $2,500 that has to be maintained every six months. We would just do smarter uh, uh, caring of our air. The most effective or the most egregious place for air pollution is your attached garage. If you air condition your house, where your house is cooler and drier than the garage, there is a very strong force that's wanting to invite the air from your garage into your house. And that air in the garage has got the off-gassing from your car, your lawnmower, your fertilizer, all that stuff. So detach the garage from the house. It will save you more on indoor air quality than an energy recovery ventilation system can give you. Sometimes we do the garage here, a covered parking area, and then you go into the house so you don't have to get wet going between the backyard or the back door and the house. If you do have a garage that's attached to your house, don't have the electrical panel put between the garage and the house, like on the kitchen wall, because air can just leak right through that panel and pollute the interior of your house. So you want to make smart choices about where you put the electrical panel. You do want to insulate even the attic above the garage so the air in the attic of the garage can't migrate into the house. If you're going to do some termite controls, and you should, don't use chemicals. We use either sand barriers where a pipe is going to come through the slab or we introduced something years ago that ABC Pest now distributes here, which is a stainless steel barrier around every penetration in the foundation to stop bugs without relying on noxious chemicals. Well, here's a simple one. Air out your carpeting and your padding for two days before you install it. 95% of the off-gassing will occur there instead of in your house. Make sure you exhaust the air well. Use a front-loading washing machine because a top loader puts a lot of soapy humidity in your house. Use timer fans on your exhaust fans to uh, make sure they run for a while, but then they shut off because you don't want to suck so much air out of the house that it goes in a negative pressure. Just like with your kitchen exhaust vent, only run it as long as it needs to to get the smell out of the kitchen. Then shut it off because if it's too powerful or running too long, it'll suck air in from the garage or suck air down the chimney. And that just pollutes the air in the house. So who would have guessed that sometimes exhaust fans can pollute your home if you run them too much or too long? And they bring in outside air. The outside air has humidity. The humidity makes for bad things to happen. Between 40 and 50 percent relative humidity is ideal. It reduces the things like dust mites and viruses and chemical interactions from occurring. So these were just some examples of some practical things you can do here to save energy and to make for better indoor air quality. I've got other things I could talk to you about today, but I think what I would rather do is open up the floor to some questions so that I can specifically hit the items that are on your mind. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Okay. Yeah, raise your hands high and we'll take your questions in the order that you raise your hand. Allison. My concern is not only uh, an environmentally friendly house, but a useful house. And then making a convertible house affordable, efficient, and uh, convertible from, say, a four-bedroom house into a two-bedroom two apartment. Okay. <laughs> and... Uh, Appliances that can easily come in and out. Rooms that be, can, can be converted. Kitchens into bedrooms. Uh, family rooms into bedrooms. Bathrooms into kitchens. Appliances. It would, ha it would involve a, an entire uh, uh, industry uh, reconfiguration. But it could be done. It should be done by probably a development in order to... Uh, save money and have a warehouse to put all the walls in that you would be replacing. Has anyone ever thought of doing housing that way? I'm not 100% sure I followed you. Um, what was your point? My point is that people move into a house for a particular purpose. And if they're first married, they need a small house. When they have children, they need a larger house. And when their children move away, they need a smaller house. 
And when their uh, parents have to move in with them, they need a larger house again. And during this time, all these changes that come about, people move back and forth and back and forth and they sell houses and buy houses. Okay. So you want a house or a building that's loose fit. Probably easier said than done, although the point's a very good point. I wish, for example, in my home that it were smaller now that my kids are all but gone. Uh, <clears throat> that's probably why we are a fairly mobile society and so many Western civilizations are. Uh, we are doing more and more duplexes, I've noticed, for folks, um, especially baby boomers who are aging. They're building duplexes so they can get the rental income or have a relative live with them, but not in their own that in their own house, so to speak. Uh, we've done more and more houses with twin master bedrooms, so there could be two couples living in them, sharing it. But I don't know the answer to what you're bringing up. I mean, and it's, I could probably help you better by staying more on topic with some of the things I'm going over here today. So are there any other questions that maybe are more directly to what yes, related? Yes, there's a question here. Would you stand and say your name, please? My name's Eva. Um, Hi, Eva. I'm buying a house that was lived in by a smoker, two smokers. Ooh. So uh, we've been doing everything that we can think of to, to clear out and to improve the air quality. Um, but I wanted to get your perspective on what are the best things to do to help improve air quality in, a, in a, that home. And also, I just also wonder about passive air. Your question, you, you, may, you talked about uh, humidity in the home. Uh, and I wonder with the humidity in the air outside our home here in Texas, if we want to just cool our house by opening up the doors and windows, uh, but let's say we have allergies, you know, it, it just seems like the natural thing to do, but I also don't want to increase the humidity in the home that would be a negative for the home. Okay, you bring up two very good points. Let me hit the first one, which is how to get rid of uh, things that smell that hold that smoking smell in the house. I had a similar problem. I had a condominium in Houston that had a smoker in. You have to get rid of the fabric things. I got rid of the curtains and the carpeting and that made the biggest difference. Uh, and of course repainting helped a lot but it was the fabric and the, of the curtains and the carpeting that held the most smell. Uh, with regard to what you were saying, bringing in, opening up the windows and bringing in the molds, the pollens and the humidity, Unfortunately, that is true. I've noticed even with myself, we have a whole house fan in my house. I love it in the spring and the fall, but I also bring in a fair bit more dust and pollen all over the house when I run it. So we do bring a little bit of outside air into our houses with this little device that's on the slide here. It's an outside air intake duct that comes directly to the bottom of the air conditioner to what's called the return air chamber. It's got a little barometrically sensitive damper inside of it that when it senses the house is in a vacuum, it opens up to make up for that lost air by bringing in fresh air only when it's needed. For example, this damper would be closed, there is there, if the air conditioner was on, because there would be no vacuum associated with the machine sucking air through the chamber. It also would be closed unless you were running the dryer or having a fire in the fireplace or cooking a meal and running the exhaust fan or taking a shower in running the exhaust fan. All four of those negatively pressurize the home and it senses the negative pressurization and it opens up a little bit just to bring in some makeup air. But it gets filtered and dehumidified before it gets distributed in the house because it's right part of the air conditioning system. And that's our little way of bringing in just the right amount of outside air, we think, at the right time. We have a question here. Would you say your name and stand, please? Hi, my name is Oralyn Likes. Um, I don't live locally. And I'm... You what? I don't live here in Austin. Oh, okay. And I am thinking in the next five years or so to, to build, and I'm wondering how widespread these principles and standards are around the country. Is there a network of architects that basically kind of follow these, these principles? That's one question. The other question is, I have dogs, and what you could say about air quality of, and, and living with dogs that 
leave a lot of dog hair around. Well, let's do the second one first. Uh, I've got two fluffy golden retrievers <clears throat> doing an awful lot of dusting. But you know what? Seriously, answer to that? A central vacuum system with an outside exhaust part of it, it, outside exhaust feature, is critically important. One of my three sons had environmentally induced asthma when we moved into the new house, even with our pets. After a few months, his symptoms went away. We had very little wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, almost all hardwood floors in the house, especially in the places of high traffic like the kitchen. And then we had an outside venting um, uh, central vac system. So when you did vacuum up that dog hair, any of the debris that didn't get caught up in the bag got blown to the outside instead of recycled in the house. That's what's really nice about an outside venting central vac system. Uh, regarding the network of architects, yeah, there has been this green building movement that's been going on for about, oh, I don't know, it's been popular probably for the past 15 years. Some of us got into it sooner than others. It was that oil embargo in 1971 or 72 that really galvanized my convictions to pursue energy efficient architecture. So for me, it's been close, closer to 35 or 40 years. Uh, there's a great newsletter you can subscribe to, buildinggreen.com. Environmental Building News is the company. They're the only people out there that I think put out reliable information because they don't take advertising dollars. You have to be so careful with what you read on the internet. I read so many things that I just think are flat wrong because they're sponsored by the American Woodworkers Institute or the American Steel Association. Obviously, they're going to tell you that steel is a better way to go. Or no matter who you read this article by, you don't know who sponsored the writing of the article. But environmental building news is not that way. So go to buildinggreen.com. And with regard to the architects, well, we're a good one. <laughs> but there are, there, I think, but when you do talk to somebody who professes to be a green architect, be cynical. Ask them, how long have you been doing this? Do you own any of these buildings? Have you operated any of these buildings that you're telling us that we should be doing this way? Because that's where I learned a lot of my lessons and why I'm able to stand up here and speak today with the level of confidence I do, because I've owned and operated these buildings over 25 to 35 years. And I've seen what works and doesn't work. So shop wisely. I don't think there's a builder nor an architect out there who will say they're not into green building. But find out who really has, proof, has the proof to back them up. We're going to try to get in just three more questions. Uh, if you could keep your questions brief, that would be great. Gary Bennett. I thought you had one. Yes, my name is Luther Elmore. I have a 30-year-old uh, two-story house, uh, and it has electric uh, air but uh, gas heating, uh, and it is one zone. Uh, Problem. Yeah, and therefore, uh, in the winter, it's not so bad. But in the summer, I have difficulty in cooling the uh, top floor. Mm -hmm. uh, without knowing anything about the house, what do you think the, the most feasible solution would be? Well, if you're having difficulty cooling the top floor, that tells you that you're probably getting a lot of solar radiation coming through your roof. So at the very least, do a radiant barrier. Uh, stapling foil up against the underside of the roof uh, would do a lot to save, uh, turn your roof into a shading umbrella. Uh, you can take it a step further. That's this material uh, where we had foil and stapled to the underside of the roof. That stops the radiation from coming in. Or you can do a combination of that, produce an airspace, and spray foam insulation to the underside of that. And that will make for an excellent roof where you're not, um, you don't ventilate the attic anymore. Uh, but before you did that, we'd want to talk. You can also do a metal roof and put it on ventilation strips so you get vent spaces between the roof and the underside of the roof, de or, and the roof decking. That's a fantastic roof. And that's what we developed uh, that then was endorsed by Oak Ridge Labs as being one of the most effective ways of saving energy regarding roofs in our country. But what you want to do is stop the radiation, is my point. Slow down the radiation from coming into the roof. We have a question here. Would you say your name, please, and stand? Bob Murray. Peter, um, 
if you believe, I, I suspect you do, that uh, we've got to get really serious about uh, climate disruption. And uh, so I'd like for you to speak to how we can expedite, accelerate uh, the use of these practices in the existing stock, because the next 15 years it's going to be dominated by what we do with the existing stock. Obviously, we want to build new as good as we can. And there's a lot of new construction in the not in Austin so much, but in the area. But the existing stock is where we have some serious mining to be done. Do you have any ideas of how we can accelerate it? New, uh, new innovative ways we could go at that? Yes, I've got a cynical but, fa but heartfelt answer. I think as a society, we need to stop fiddling and farting around with bling, with eco bling, and get serious about physics. Let me give you an example. If we took one tenth the amount of money that the federal government put into incenting the solar industry, the Obama administration put into incenting the solar industry, if we took one tenth that money and just got serious with regard to conservation strategies for existing homes, we could have saved between four and ten times the amount of energy. The thing that bothers me and why I had that term eco-bling in the title, it's my own term I came up with years ago, because it's what we get wrapped up in in our society. We get into bling, the solar panels on the roof, the tankless water heaters, the geothermal heat pumps. I'm sick of it. It's bling. The real stuff is, just as you were alluding to, go into a home and do basic things to make it use less energy. Replace your weather stripping around your doors. Weather stripping doesn't last forever. If it's more than five years old, replace it, especially the door between the garage and the house. So reduce infiltration. That's the number one cause of energy consumption. Test your air conditioning ducts. Make sure they're airtight. If they're anything less than airtight, fix them. Because if you have 10% duct leakage, you've got really twice that percentage in terms of overall system problems. 10% duct leakage makes for a 20% reduction in your overall air conditioning system's efficiency because when the air leaks, it makes that much air want to suck in from the outside. So it doubles the work for the air conditioner. So fix your ducts. Make sure your house is tight. Do a blower door test. You might find that your kitchen exhaust vent has been jammed in the open position for the past 28 years. It's not a joke. It's the simple stuff like that. Close your chimney flue and then shade your windows. Remember awnings? You know, we get all wrapped up in this super duper low E glass. Screw it. Just shade your windows. That's a 100% shading coefficient instead of a 60 or 70% shading coefficient. Um, replace your roof with a light colored roof. But unfortunately, it's going to get dirty, so I think a radiant barrier roof is even better. See, this is my roof, eight years old. See how dirty it got? So it's not just the light color, it's the radiant barrier underneath it. But basic things like that to the existing housing stock will have a profoundly greater effect than the bling. That's my answer. We have a question here. Would you stand and say your name? Uh, Clifford May. And uh, thank you, Peter, for a lot of wonderful points that are close to my heart as well. Um, before we go, I'd like to hear a few thoughts about gray water and water efficiency and economy in the houses. All right. We have a minute or two about that? Uh, Clifford, I'm not sure if I brought the slides for that, but let me just talk about it. It's the same thing as energy consumption. Use less, using less water is going to be your most effective strategy when it comes to uh, being a good steward of water. I know you've heard of rainwater collection systems, and we've probably done 90 to 100 of them over the past 25 years in our homes and buildings in central Texas and throughout the country. Great. But you know where you really use your water? And I, when I chaired the Resource Management Commission, we always made those uh, the strategies we gave money for or incentives for, as I said in the early part of the talk, we always wanted to go back and vet them. Just looking at your sprinkler system and seeing how, if it's adjusted right, we typically overwater our yards. 
And oftentimes the sprinklers are spraying on the wrong surface or they're spraying at the house. Just go out there and be very parsimonious with the amount of water you put on your lawn. I went from using, I saved 20,000 to 30,000 gallons a month at my own house, which I thought I zero escaped, by radically changing the sprinkler settings over a course of a few months compared to what the sprinkler and the landscaping people had me do. I cut down to 8 to 12 minutes a zone just once a week in my lawn. It's fine. Um, after we take care of that type of stuff, make sure you have water efficient appliances and shower heads, things like that. So use less water inside the house. Use less water outside the house. Then if you've done that, you can consider a, a, a rainwater collection system. But you have to have an awfully big tank for it to make any difference, at least 10,000 gallons. So it's expensive. Then if you've done those three things, then you can look at gray water recovery. But gray water recovery is phenomenally expensive given what you benefit from. Uh, spend the same amount of money or spend much less money and get an ultra low flow toilet or two, you know, dual flush. So I know we're out of time. You have about maybe two more minutes to oh, wrap up. Okay. So the point there was Look at where you're wasting the most amount of water, and I bet you it's associated with the lawn sprinklers and maybe the swimming pool, too. That's the other thing. Uh, I, I had a lady who wanted to do a rainwater collection system, and I went over to her house and saw that her swimming pool was constantly on refill. She didn't realize that. and It was constantly overflowing at one end and constantly pouring new water in at the other end. She had never realized that that little refill valve was stuck in the open position. And she, she was talking about doing a rainwater system, and she had each zone running for about 25 minutes for her lawn, because that's what the sprinkler guy said she should do. Question authority. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that helps. Well, thank you for a startling and eye-opening presentation and debunking a lot of, uh, I guess, eco-bling myths, and I'm sure that uh, we'll all take another look at what we're doing and hopefully conserve more. Thank you so much. Thank you.